board decision making. So the Senate subcommittee that investigated the collapse of Enron identified 16 red flags known to the board over a three year period, including three occasions in which the board waived the conflict of interest policy on three separate transactions for Andy Fastow. The board of HP was excoriated widely and loudly over more than a decade for a series of decisions so long we couldn't possibly get through them. And those are only some really widely publicized examples. Boards of companies of every size and stage make good decisions, not so good decisions, and bad decisions. So how do we help them make better decisions? That's what today is all about. So our moderator, Rebecca McEnroy, will lead our panel, Bob Duke and Art Markman, in a round robin discussion. Then we'll have a Q&A with you. On your tables or slips of paper, jot the question down, hold the slip up, we'll come and get it and bring them to Rebecca. So that's how we're gonna do it. Rebecca McEnroy is an executive producer with KUT and KUT.org, and she hosts, co-creates, and is producer of numerous shows, including Two Guys on Your Head with our panelists, Bob Duke and Art Markman, certainly on every Friday at our house on KUT in the morning, if you listen to that, as well as uh, the write-up with Owen Edgerton, liner notes with Rabbi Neil Blumoff. She's got a new program coming up, The Secret Ingredient, later this month. Bob Duke and Art Markman are both distinguished professors and scholars. Bob is a professor of music and human learning, director of the Center for Music Learning. He's the author of software as well as books, numerous books. And two facts I like, he's a former studio musician and a public school teacher. And Art is a professor of psychology and director of the program on human dimensions of organizations. He's executive editor of the Journal of Cognitive Science. And like Bob, he's the author of numerous books. I don't quite believe Art when he says that it pains him to admit that he's on the Limericks co Committee of the Psychology Department. But we, that's probably a topic for another day. So with that, let me turn it over to Rebecca and let's get going. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that was so kind. And thank Thanks you all. for having us today because this is really a lot of fun. Has anybody heard the show? Oh, yeah. Um, this morning I thought maybe we could start off by talking about a lot of the myths that we kind of carry with us. We think we make decisions a certain way. We think that we're having impact in a certain way when maybe we're really not. So what are some of the myths about decision making that come to mind for you guys? Well, one big one is that we make them <laughs> uh, uh, because we certainly within our own consciousness, uh, had the impression that uh, we take in information from the world around us, we listen to people talk, and we read, and we think, and then we come to a decision, and then we act. And again, from inside our own consciousness, it kind of feels like that's what's happening. But as uh, we'll talk about today, that's, that's often not, not the case. That's right, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that goes along with that that I think is important is um, we often really do try to tamp down on the emotional component of our decision making. You know, we're like, people, people, let's, let's you know, make a rational choice here. Um, without, without actually recognizing how intimately connected our emotions are to our ability to evaluate things in ways where it turns out that, that if we, if we divorce our, our ability to think through things carefully from the emotional experience we have, we often make worse decisions, not better ones. And so, you know, those are a couple that spring to mind that I think are just important to keep in mind as we start talking a little bit about how people make decisions and, and, and what, some, what are some of the things we can do to, to, to do them more effectively. And, and I think one thing just to, just to amplify about Art's last point <clears throat> is, you know, there, there's a reason, uh, an evolutionary reason, why our emotions kick in when we have to make complicated decisions. Because most of the decisions that we make are not concerning a single variable. I mean, most of the decisions we make are multifarious. They have a number of variables that are moving at the same time. And, you know, we'd like to think, well, I can make a list, you know, and I can just make a positive list and a negative list. And I, I, I think, uh, just a little aside, I think PowerPoint sort of reinforces that idea that everything in the world is, you know, expressible in bullet points. When in fact, when you start to think about the world that way, uh, PowerPoint actually, actually makes you stupider. Uh, 
And, and I think many of us have sat through PowerPoint sessions having left thinking that our IQ is a few points lower than it was when the session started. Uh, for various reasons, but, <laughs> but, but, but one of the things to think about what, you know, when you say you're going with your gut, what, what that really means is <clears throat> I have a collection of memories in my head that I can't necessarily bring to mind and articulate uh, fully, but th they're in there and they're driving some of the decision making that I'm making. So emotional decision making is not like, you know, reason, good, emotion, bad. And I think that's another myth that we need to think about. It's not that the decisions that when we really make good decisions, we've just reasoned it out very carefully because there's some very well-reasoned decisions that are nevertheless bad decisions. And, and okay, so, so Rebecca, Rebecca, you're gonna realize Rebecca's gonna just keep hoping. I know, <laughs> I never get a word in, but it's okay. They're but, smarter than me. But, but actually it's worth figuring out where these emotions are coming from mm -hmm. just if we're, gonna, if we're gonna play this game. So I don't know how many of you have ever seen a brain before. Um, I, didn't, I brought one with me, but it's busy at the moment, so I can't show it to you. Um, but, but a brain sort of looks like a pair of boxing gloves set the wrong way around, thumbs on the outside, a little bumpier than your typical boxing glove. Gray in color on the outside, so of course neuroscientists call that gray matter. Um, dig down, you get a couple of millimeters down, it turns from gray to white. Uh, that's the, that we call that white matter. Um, it's, it's really Amazing. tough here. This, this, so, is very, this is a very sophisticated talk. Yeah. I hope you're following along so far. So, so um, now if you, if you continue slicing through the brain, and all that white stuff is actually uh, insulation on nerve fibers. It's, it's, it's the little wiring tracts that are carrying information from one area of the brain to another. Get way deep in the brain, you come to some more gray matter, um, and that stuff, see, and, and now just, just to prove we're not, we're, we're, we're not we're, we're, it's not all that, that easy. You get deep into the brain, you hit a bunch of structures called the basal ganglia. So we got white matter, gray matter, basal ganglia. Um, and, uh, and, and the basal ganglia are part of these, these circuits that are really important for engaging your goals, for uh, driving your habits, and, and for motivational, uh, motivation in general. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, all those structures deep inside the brain, those are the things we share with rats and mice and deer and all kinds of other animals that aren't as articulate as people are. Uh, and, and what that means is that we built the rest of the human brain on top of that stuff, literally on top of that, in ways where it doesn't actually connect all that well to what's going on with the motivational system. The implication of that is that there are a lot of things that we do and are motivated to do that don't actually connect that well to the storytelling apparatus of our brain, which means that there is information about our motivational system that isn't actually making it out to the storytelling piece, which means that all of this very rational, very um, uh, you know, kind of linear thinking that we do is, is not well connected to the motivations that drive our behavior. Now, what does this mean? How, how, in fact, do we get any sense of what the motivational system is doing? Part of the way we get that sense is through the emotions we experience, because that is, in fact, the best way that the motivational system communicates with the rest of the brain. And so a lot of times the information you are getting about the feelings that you're having, when you have that gut feeling, that little spidey sense that goes off that tells you something's not quite right, that is a signal that your motivational system is feeling like there's <coughs> something that's blocking an important goal of yours, even if you can't put a finger on it yet, where putting the finger on it is essentially getting the storytelling apparatus aligned with what's going on so that you can tell the right story about it. And so you're actually getting somewhat independent bits of information from the emotional system and from your, your uh, more rational system. And if we think about the stories of bad decision making that Ralph was, was raising at the very beginning, a lot of that reflects that in the absence of an emotional experience, we can talk ourselves into almost anything, right? And, and often you find yourself having to kind of, you know, push back that, that negative feeling in order to kind of go with the story that makes sense. And, and in those situations where you find yourself fighting against the, the emotional state, it's worth taking a step back before just agreeing that this is a really good story and we should go ahead with it and asking yourself, why is there a misalignment between what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and another thing that kind of goes along with that is this idea that once somebody is, has made a decision or once something seems to make sense, it's really easy to kind of go along with that, even though as a leader on the board or as a, a director, 
you think, oh, I'm going to have to push back on this somehow because that's my role. But talk yeah. a little bit about you know why people think that things are a good idea, the ball gets rolling, and then it doesn't stop. Yeah. Uh, you know, Art mentioned a, a really important point uh, for once. about yeah <laughs> one finally uh, <laughs> that that our that our brains are really good at doing and that's telling stories um, and I, I want to talk again about our perception of the timing of all of that right I mean often one can't explain a decision or a, a behavior or whatever uh, based on a chain of events that this led to that led to that led to that and then this happened right. Uh, and as little children, you know, that's the way we learn to read and learn to communicate, you know, and you, somebody's telling about a book they read, you know, and then the turtle came, and then the next thing happened, you have this sort of linear thing. And so it's understandable that we would think that's the way our lives work, right? And that story kind of tells. Well, there are a lot of decision makings, as Art was saying, the, you know, the, a, a part of our brain that is not verbally accessible uh, to us is influencing our behavior in such a way, in ways that we may not or often are not aware of at all. <clears throat> so the story part of our brain makes up a story uh, to explain what just happened. Uh, and it does this very quickly. Uh, you know, we, 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 we like to think that when we're coming up with that story about how this thing happened, what we're doing is an analysis of all the stuff that led up to that decision. But actually what our brains are doing are concocting a very nice story. And often the nice stories that our brains develop have only a faint resemblance to what actually led to the thing that the story is about. Now, that's a dramatic issue when you're talking about decision making, whether you're making a decision on your own or you're making a decision as part of a group or helping to lead a group to come to some decision, because we have to acknowledge as human beings that there are all these things that are operating in our environment. I mean, who talked first? Uh, what, what is the social status of the person whose idea is being put forward? Have we had lunch yet? And, and I'm not being facetious. I mean, I mean, we are so affected by all of those things. And there's just innumerable investigations and lots of data that illustrates this point over and over again in a lot of different, different contexts. But because we're smart, it's possible for us to sit back and say, well, I, I can just do the reasoning of all, all of this, not recognizing the part that our brain is so motivated to explain what happened that even when it doesn't have an explanation, it will make one up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the things we need to recognize about this is that our brains are also designed for action. So the, the thing about brains is they're very expensive to operate. So that brain, 3% of your body weight uses 20 to 25% of your daily energy supply. No matter how hard you're thinking, that's just that's basically the cost of keeping the lights on. And, uh, and so the brain, the brain doesn't want to spend a lot of time just deliberating. It wants to actually get you to a point where you can act. Now, how does it do that? One of the ways that it does that is by helping you to believe that the decision you've just made is a really good one. Uh, and, and it does that in a very interesting way. So think about what happens you, you know, in, a, in a boardroom. You come in and, and there's a diversity of opinion in that room and you begin to, to reach a, a consensus. And we love that word, consensus. Now it turns out that not only do we reach a consensus among a group of individuals, we actually reach a consensus inside the brain. So what's happening is, if you think about the multiple factors that might lead to a decision, some of which might point you, let's say, let's say you're making a yes-no decision on something, some of which, some of these factors are pushing you towards the yes decision, some of them are pushing you towards the no. As you begin leaning towards yes, let's say, um, all of the factors that are consistent with yes start getting more important to you and all of the things that are consistent with no actually start getting less important to you. So that by the time you reach the end of the decision, all of those yes factors are screaming out in your brain, yes, and there's a very small number of these no factors going, no. <laughs> and that means that by the end of the process, you, you are now thoroughly convinced you've made the right choice. Now, that's great from the standpoint of action because it, it allows the brain to say, okay, all hands on deck, let's go do this thing. But from the standpoint of, say, corporate governance, all of those nagging factors that might have led you to say no, they're still there. Right. And they still may be very important and you still may want to revisit them later if things don't go as anticipated. But your brain is discounting them. It's pushing them all to the side. 
which means it's very important to create external records that you actually keep around and, 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 and revisit every once in a while to remind yourself of all the reasons maybe we shouldn't have done this. Mm -hmm so that you don't get lulled into believing that this was just the thing that we were supposed to do. And, and I think one of the things that Art said a minute ago about brains were designed to act, right? I, I mean, when, when the parts of our brains evolve, especially the primitive parts that Art was referring to earlier, the basal ganglia and the striatum and all that kind of stuff, in all those parts of our brains that are more primitive parts of our brains, uh, contemplation and reflection was not a value, right? If, if, if you are an early hominid walking on the savanna. Or a deer. Or a deer, <laughs> and there's a very large animal coming towards you at high speed, contemplation is not an advantage. Uh, you need to get moving, and you need to decide that thing doesn't look friendly, and I should probably run that way. And, and the idea of thinking about it and reasoning about it, there's no advantage to that. And, and as Art was saying, when, the, when what we consider the reasoning, thinking part of our brain evolved, the old stuff didn't go away. It didn't replace the old stuff. The old stuff's there, it's operating, it's doing its thing, even now, right? And all of you right now are having experiences in this room that are different from the people sitting next to you. All of us carried into the room with us a different set of memories. And what all of our brains are trying to do right now is connect what's going on right now to the memories that are already in our head, completely below our conscious awareness. So often, I'm sure we've sat in meetings, let's say a board meeting, at the kitchen table with our family, and you think, well, here's everybody just got the same information given to them. How could they come to a different decision? If everybody got the same data, why could people come to different decisions about the same data? It's because everyone's interpreting the data in relation to the memories that are in our heads, some of which are accessible and verbalizable, and many of which are completely inaccessible. So, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking that or feeling that about that. You know, we have a thing that Rebecca and Art and I say when, uh, on the show, we say something particularly pithy, and we say, you know, we should, we should cross this out on a pillow. So, uh, so here's something that cross this on a pillow. Good decisions generally think right and they feel right, right? If both of those conditions aren't satisfied, it's probably worth revisiting that decision. A lot. Yeah. yeah, I like that saying a lot. Yeah, yeah, don't you think? Yeah, we, we should we we should definitely have that on a pillow. So I want I want to follow up. <laughs> I want to follow up on, on one of the things that Bob just said. Um, so so one of the other things that happens now. So let's think about the boardroom for a second. Um, we we're trying to come to a decision, and we've got this this group that had different experiences. So they they come to the table with a bunch of of different ideas. Um, very quickly, one of the things that happens is as soon as people start opening their mouths and speaking is that, that now people's memories become contaminated by the words that are spoken by other people. Because if you think about what, what speech does, when somebody says something, what they're doing is they're literally getting inside your head. Okay, they, the words that they are using are creating thoughts inside of your head. Now the thing about creating a thought inside somebody's head is that if, if, because by speaking to a whole group and creating a very similar thought in everyone's heads, I am uh, uh, influencing the chain of thought that, that everyone in the room is having. And after about five minutes of discussion, the entire group is now thinking more similarly than it did five minutes before uh, when the discussion hadn't started yet. Now, why does this matter? Because a lot of times we get into, the, into a boardroom or, a, or a, a, a group discussion and we say, you know what? We need to come up with a great solution to this problem. Let's, uh, let's start throwing some ideas around. Under the assumption that if we brainstorm this thing together with all the great minds that we've brought together, we're gonna come up with a great solution. The fundamental problem with that is that as soon as the first person speaks, and the first person who speaks is often the extrovert in the room, of course in a boardroom that's a lot of extroverts <laughs> and maybe even a couple of narcissists, um, but... <laughs> None of you would fit the description. <laughs> um, but you, the first person says something. It turns out that the person who speaks first, um, extroversion and narcissism are uncorrelated with having good ideas. And, and I don't mean negatively correlated. I mean uncorrelated. You might have a good idea. You might not have a good idea. What we do know is as soon as you say something, you have contaminated everybody else in the room, which means that getting the group together to brainstorm is a terrible idea. Because as soon as people start saying something, the entire group converges on a smaller set of ideas. 
So, so here's another principle to walk away from. If you're trying to, to use your board to generate some potential ideas, remember that individuals working alone diverge in their ideas and groups talking together converge. So when you're trying to get a multiplicity of opinions, send an email to everybody first with an assignment and have them all send you their ideas uh, and, and compile them together and then bring them to the meeting on a sheet, let everybody start to hash through them as the group and let the group converge on a solution. Because if you try to get the divergence to happen in the group setting, what you're gonna create, and this is another, um, another technical term. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of research on what's called productivity loss in brainstorming. So what we know is as soon as you get a group together, that group generates fewer ideas and fewer good ideas than the individuals would have come up with if they'd worked alone. So what you wanna do is get the individuals working alone first, then get the group together and let them talk about it so that you get both a decent divergence and a decent convergence, um, rather than starting the process by having, having everyone talk together. And, and one, of, one of the factors that kind of pushes this along is that most of us have a low level of tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, the, the, what do you the, mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, the term that's often applied to this is a need for closure, right? Let's just, let's just decide, let's just get it done. And, and again, there are evolutionary advantages to that, but, if you've got a lot of variables operating and you really want to consider what all that can be, Art's point about allowing people to do things alone that they have to put down on a screen or on paper changes the way people come to a group discussion. But I want to emphasize one other thing about that that's valuable too. Art and I spend a lot of time talking with our students about this. Most students think this is how things work. I think and then I write about what I thought not recognizing the fact that when you write, you're thinking. It's not a matter, we're not Mozart. You know, we, we imagine the symphony, I've got it all down, then I just write down what's in my head. That's not what happens when we write. When we write, it actually affects what our thinking is about this. And I think if, if there's an if there's a, 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 a extremely undervalued tool that we think about is it's the, the, the opportunity to write your, about your ideas. Because what most people find out about is that when you start writing, your ideas change. Because now they're just not rolling around in your head. We have a tremendous capacity for self-delusion, right? And, and anybody who's had a great idea, I thought this is a great idea, and then you start to write about it, you think, this is a terrible idea. Why, why, did, why didn't you realize that when you were thinking about it? Because again, we have a need for closure, and we have a low tolerance for ambiguity, and as Rebecca said a minute ago, once we start to lean toward a decision, we're motivated below our conscious awareness to find more support for the lean that now doesn't become a lean, it becomes a topple because now we want to get closure on that decision. Yeah. And, and, and I want to follow up on this idea. It's the, if you think about what writing is, writing is this process of, of creating a fairly explicit verbal statement of some idea that we have that's kind of chaotic in our heads. And writing is good because it, it gets it out on a page and because it forces you to actually say it in a linear way. If you actually look at the transcripts of most conversations, there are very few complete sentences that are spoken. Um, we fill in other people's sentences. People get halfway through a sentence and then shift directions and go somewhere else with it. So, you know, if you, and I know there's a few lawyers in the audience. If you, when you look at court transcripts, you realize, like, would someone just speak a verb? A, just like a verb, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but there is, there's also value in forcing people to articulate things in a, in, in a you know, just in a, in a discussion, in a group. And so uh, here's another thing, uh, another tip, right, for the, for the boardroom. I want you all to go back today and reclaim the word why, the question why. So it turns out that one of the most fundamental questions you can ever ask about anything is why. And the reason why matters is because the answer to the why question involves what psychologists call causal knowledge, which is knowledge about the way the world works. And if you're actually gonna do something productive, rather than just doing what you did last time, you need to know why things work the way they do. 
Otherwise, like if you think about it, and a lot of you, some of you may be real computer whizzes, but a lot of you do what I do. When my computer stops working the way I want it to, I restart it. Why do I do that? Well, because I don't really know what's going on in my computer, and restarting the computer is the 21st century equivalent of whapping the side of the TV set when the <laughs> screen was going funny. Um, so, but, 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 but when, when the computer really isn't working, even after the restart, I gotta call the IT people, and the IT people actually know what's going on. They can answer the why question, and then they reason through what to do. Now, a lot of times, we actually begin to make decisions, even at the board level, where we're not actually 100% clear on, on what the why answer is for, for some of the things that are going on inside the business. If you think, for example, about the financial collapse in 2006 and 7, and if you read a lot of the, the, the writing that happened after that, it was very clear a lot of people didn't really understand all of the moving parts that went into mortgage originations and creating these, these structured financial instruments and the, and the, and the, 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 the credit default swaps that, that followed. And those people who did understand it ended up making a lot of money on the backs of people who didn't. Now, how do you begin to articulate the, why, the, the answer to the question why? Well, you've got to start by asking the question why. Now, here's the problem. We are such a polite society now that we often don't want to confront people directly. So when we want to disagree with them, we often don't say, I disagree. What we do instead is we say, why are we going to do that? And that's our signal to, for you to, you know, you then <laughs> articulate the reason why and then I argue with the why as a way of saying I disagree with what we're doing. Now the problem with using why as a way of saying I disagree is that now why has become an aggressive question. As soon as somebody asks why, we get defensive because we think that somebody's disagreeing with us. We need to stop that. We need to actually be a little bit less agreeable and say I disagree with this course of action rather than why and reserve why to be a question that means I'd like to understand the causal structure of this better so that all of us can do a better job of reasoning through the situation and understanding the moving parts that are leading to the conclusions that we're drawing. Because if we don't begin to make that explicit, we can all merrily go along and only later discover when somebody analyzes the decisions of the board, discover all the reasons why we should have been more skeptical of the course of action that we ended up taking. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you we know, could put why on a pillow. <laughs> why do you say that? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I really... Don't disagree. <laughs> I, want to, I want to talk about kind of like the dynamics, the gender dynamics of the boardroom and why it's really important to have diversity there, you know, in, in all elements. But before we get there, there's one more myth that maybe we can talk a little bit about. And it gets back to the way that our brains function neurologically, which is that we think because we make a little decision, like should I have coffee or tea, or should I use a green pen or a red pen, or, you know, whatever, that, that those decisions are taking up less energy than the big decisions. Like, should I have chemo or should I, you know what I mean? It's so scary, yeah. never mind, didn't mean to go there. <laughs> but uh, but I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the way that our brains use that energy and this idea of um, decision fatigue. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So one of the things to remember about brains is, so they use a lot of energy and actually the more energy that we use at any given time, um, the, the frontal lobes of your brain are, are, are fairly new evolutionary uh, things. So remember we have that, that, that boxing glove, the frontal lobes are the, are the fingers of that boxing glove. They are the area that distinguishes the human brain from a lot, you know, if you look at a, a, a mouse brain, for example, a lot of those same structures deep in the brain, but very little frontal lobe, which is why mice don't deliberate a lot over the things that they're doing and humans deliberate more. Um, when we deliberate over a choice, um, we, there are a couple of things that are going on. One is we're trying to reason through it, but another is there are two potential actions we could take, so coffee and tea. Those, those actions might require me to actually move in different directions. And so when I make a decision, not only have I reasoned through this, but I also have to inhibit one action in order to perform another. And that inhibitory system um, is, is in the frontal lobes, it's fairly new, and it gets tired pretty quickly. 
okay? So the more time that I spend during the day making choices of any kind, inhibiting my actions, so you know, you're sitting in a board meeting and there's, there's, there's invariably a board member who's, um, who you'd like to take outside and throttle, but you can't because it's just not right. So, <laughs> so you spend a lot of time inhibiting the action of closing your hands around that person's throat while imagining it. Um, and, and so all of those actions um, weaken the frontal lobes until you have a chance to take a nap or something. So all of those little actions, little decisions, little acts of self-control, all of those things make it harder and harder to make additional decisions and to, and to, make, uh, and, and to exhibit uh, additional self-control. So part of what this means is um, don't, for example, start your board meeting by clearing off a lot of little decisions before you get to the big thing, right? Because this is gonna take most of our time, so let's, let's clear off these 12 other things first and then get to the big things. Now you get to the big thing and everyone's already been mentally drained by making all these tiny little decisions. They're gonna do a worse job of deliberating the big thing than if you started with that even if you ended up having to email about the little stuff later. And you know, I, I, I think one of the things to consider that's sort of a fascinating aspect of our functioning is how little it takes to tire out that inhibitory system. We're exhausted. For we're, we're exhausted. <laughs> uh, but, but one of the things that, that I, I think is a, an interesting experiment that sort of illustrates this is, uh, and I'll just tell you this, this study quick. Uh, the, 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 the nature of the project was to find out how do you get uh, people to make a decision by busying, by engaging the, the thinking part of their brain, the verbal part of their brain, uh, such that it can't really do the inhibitory stuff it needs to do to keep the more primitive emotional part of our brains from operating. So here's the scenario. People go into a room, they're checking in, they're gonna be an experimental subject, which means they're probably an undergraduate student at the University of the United States. Uh, and they come into this room where they think the study's gonna happen, but actually there's a proctor there as in fill out a form. And uh, they go into the room and the proctor says, okay, the actual study is down the hall. Uh, so I'm gonna, I, I took your data here. I'd like you to remember this number, and when you go down the room, tell uh, the person down the, down, down the hall your subject number, and, uh, and they'll start, the, they'll start the, ex the experiment. That's actually not true, uh, because when the person walked out into the hall, there was a confederate, which is what we call people who were in on the study, uh, walking down the hall with a tray of snacks. And uh, what the confederate says to the subject in the hallway is, you know, we've got these extra things here, would you like a snack? And there's two sides of the tray. One side has little paper cups with pieces of chocolate cake, and the other side has little cups the same size with pieces of fruit. Now the dependent measure of the study is who takes the chocolate cake and who takes the fruit, right? Now some people, when they were given their subject number to walk down the hall and remember, were given a two digit number, right? Other people were given a seven digit number. So some people had to remember seven digits, like the length of a phone number before we had to start using area codes all the time. And some people had to remember two digits. Now, you know why I'm, what I'm gonna say, because I wouldn't be telling the story if I wasn't gonna say this. The people who had to remember seven digits were much more likely to take the chocolate cake than the fruit. Now, why is that? Because when you have time to think and your brain is not occupied, you can say, well, you know, I don't, I don't need chocolate cake. You know, good guys, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I, you know, I'll take the fruit, right? But of course, that primitive part of our brain that evolved at a time when sugar and fats were in very short supply Right? That part of our brain says, chocolate cake, look at that. And, my, and the other part of my brain is saying, 1732478. So I'm busy, so I'm getting the cake. Now, you think, really, that's all it takes? Five more digits? And now the part of my brain is supposed to reason and inhibit all of those primitive responses is too busy to function? Pretty much. Now, 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 now that's, that's daunting right, as a thinker and as a human being, because now we are recognizing how easy it is to thwart the capacity to think and reason clearly, right? We talked at the very beginning today when we first started about numerous examples of where time of day and hunger and other things influence very, very important decisions. Probably the most prominent one, the study done in Israel, parole board in Israel, and they were, they were looking at the, the decisions of parole boards. I mean, this is not, these are life consequential decisions, right? They're making all the time. 
and, and, and found that decisions were, tr were tremendously varied on cases that had the exact same characteristics if the case was brought up before lunch or after lunch, or before a break or after a break. Now, we, we, we human beings think very highly of ourselves, and we think, goodness, we're better than that. You know, actually, five digits, that's it, and you're going for the cake. Now, Again, when you think about that in terms of the consequence of decision making, one of the things that Art said that I think is a great takeaway from this is the value of independently writing ideas before you start talking as a group. Because again, that increases the extent to which you're going to, first of all, have time and not be under a time pressure and not be under a social pressure to be fluent and lovely when you express your idea. And you get to edit before things get said out loud. And now you're in a very different thing because one of the things about the verbalizing part is once I say it out loud, that's become a little precious to me. And other people have heard me say it, so I feel a little need to defend that because I've now gone public with my bad idea, <laughs> right? Which would be very different if I've had time to write and think and maybe edit and maybe have other people look at what I've written and then we start talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and then Rebecca was just raising this question of diversity in boardrooms. So let's, let's, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. And let's actually start with gender diversity, right? So um, it turns out men and women are different. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean it's, and, and, and you know, it's funny, right? There was a, there was a big move in the, in the 1960s. My, one of my, I was, Bob and I were talking about this last week. One, one, of my, one of the psychologists I respect very deeply is a woman named Eleanor Maccabee. Um, and and she, she started off her career with the intention of demonstrating that boys and girls were identical until they were socialized and that it was all just a matter of we socialize boys and girls differently and that's what makes them different. And, uh, and she came and gave this talk in the 1980s and she said that was, that was going to be my goal as a scientist and she said and it turned out it wasn't true. Um, that, that actually boys and girls are very different from the beginning. So, you know, you, you, you create classrooms and you give, a, you know, boys a bunch of dolls and the dolls are now fighting with each other. <laughs> and you give girls a bunch of trucks and the trucks start a family. And, I mean, we, from, from very early on, we're, we're engaged in very different kinds of activities as a function of gender. Now, of course, not every boy is the same, not every girl is the same. There's diversity even within genders. But, but on average, there are these kinds of differences. And so one of the differences that, I want, that I'll talk about is there is a dimension called, uh, of, of self-concept that, that, that relates to how independently or interdependently we think of ourselves. So if I asked you to write down five answers to the question, who am I? Okay, and you could write that down. You know, and you could try this exercise later, although now I'm contaminating you. There are two types of answers you could give. One of the answers might be an, a kind of independent answer. I could say, I'm smart, I'm confident, I am a professor. I, these are all descriptions that are, are descriptions of me more or less independently of anyone else. But I could also have said, I'm a father, I'm a member of a band, I am, um, I'm a part of, of a department. All of these, uh, all of those descriptions are interdependent. In order to make that description, I actually have to recognize my relationship to other people, right? As a member, as a father, I am explicitly recognizing that, that I have children that I'm related to. Um, now, why does this matter? If you sit, and they do, they've done a bunch of studies on this, you take a bunch of men, a bunch of women from the same culture, and you ask them to that question, who am I? On average, the men tend to generate many, many more independent descriptions of themselves. The women generate many more interdependent descriptions of themselves. Well, what does this mean? It, 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 this translates into what we end up paying attention to in the world in general. On average, men tend to, to decontextualize things. To, 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 consider each, to, to consider events independently, to consider people in terms of their characteristics. And women, on average, tend to look at the context in which things are happening. They tend to want to know, how is this event related to these six other things that happened? How is the behavior of this person being influenced by the situation they're in and not just their personality characteristics? Which is better? 
they're both important. Mm -hmm. The characteristics of objects, events, and people matter, and the context in which those things happen matters. Yep. If you bias yourselves too far on one side or the other, you miss important bits of information. The more diversity, gender diversity you create in a boardroom, the more likely it is that you are gonna get both sides of that represented. You're gonna get discussions of the, of the characteristics of things and the context in which they happen. Uh, that discussion is gonna become a natural part of what happens in the boardroom. He used the word very deliberately, uh, on average, I guess that's two words, yeah, on, on average, you know, women fill in the blank, and on average men, and that's an important thing to think about because of course, it doesn't mean that any given woman is more likely to do something than any given man in a certain context. We're talking about group things that are tendencies, right? But I, I think the issue of diversity in any environment, in a workplace, in a school, or whatever, uh, often fails because the approach that's taken in creating a diverse environment is to pretend that everybody's the same. And this is the, 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 the colleague that Art was talking about, about let's just make sure that we pretend that everybody's the same, when in fact everybody's not the same. I mean, not only based on their gender, based on whether they grew up in the Northeast or they grew up in the South, or I mean, there are all kinds of differences that people bring to the table. The key to being accepting of differences is not pretending the differences don't exist. That's doomed. Right? The key to creating acceptance in diverse environments is to recognize differences and not have a problem with it. That's a different thing. Right? I mean, when Art uses the, the, the phrase on average, what we're saying is, I don't know anything about any individual man or woman based on what he just said. Because any individual may or may not be close to the average. Right? But we often, when we look at data and, and interpret data in any situation, you know, we, we use mean values a lot. Right? But often, the mean value is not representative of any single data point in the whole array. Right? The mean is a fiction. It's a way of summarizing a large number of numbers in some way that makes it succinct. But the succinctness often masks the differences and the spread of all those individual numbers in the array in ways that actually lead to faulty thinking. But, but I, I, I think the thing to, to emphasize about this whole thing about diversity and, and making this a thing is to recognize the value of having people who are different in the room together because they bring different things to the table. And whether those differences have to do with uh, upbringing or language or gender or disability or whatever it happens to be, recognizing that those things lead to differences among human beings that are impossible to effectively ignore and so we have to take a different tack on how we deal with that. Is not, we don't say that people aren't, aren't different, we say that people are different and those differences enhance the effectiveness of the group. Yeah. And, and, I, and just one more thing on this. I'm sorry. I, don't worry. I gotta, um, but, but you know, <laughs> we'll be here till noon. That's right. <laughs> We're here all day. Um, the, you could then ask the question, well, okay, so how do we create diversity, right? Because it actually turns out to be hard. I mean, you, you all know this, if you look at at any kind of organization, but, but, but boards in particular, it's, it's hard to create good diversity. And, and why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because when we try to construct groups, we often do it by asking people for recommendations. And when somebody said, gives you a recommendation, generally speaking, they do it kind of off the cuff, which means they're using their memories. And, and so what they do is they give you the most accessible thing, the thing that they think of first. So for example, if I said to all of you, look, I want you to list all the vegetables you can on a sheet, You'll, you, you could do, you could probably list 10 or 20 vegetables in a minute. And chances are the first one you come up with is gonna be carrot. Why? Because that's just like the easy, for whatever reason, that's like the <laughs> easiest vegetable to think about, carrot. Um, well, the same thing ends up happening when you start getting asked for, well, who, you know, I, I, got a, I got a seat on my board, I need to fill it, who, you ask five people who they should, and they just think of the first thing that comes to mind. The first thing that comes to mind is generally somebody who kind of looks like a board member. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you keep repopulating your board with people who look like board members, you end up with a lot of people who look very similar. Uh, on the board, which means that to create diversity, you actually need to be much more systematic than that. You really need to kind of generate these lists when you don't need a board member, 
you know, out of the context of needing to, to do this thing right now, and then hold on to those lists and pay attention to some of these people over a longer period of time, particularly ones who don't look like typical board members, and then, and so that when the need arises, you've already got those people in mind rather than relying on people's memories. Because, and we've looked at this, for example, in entrepreneurial communities. So, you know, in, in my own research life, you know, if you look at, at the entrepreneur, you know, Austin, as you know, as a, as a great high tech entrepreneurial community, there's a lot more men who end up as the CEOs. Of, of high tech startups than women, despite the fact that there are an awful lot of women involved in the high tech industry. Why? Because, because when you're looking for business talent to go along with this great tech guy who came up with an idea but has no business running a company, um, you, you, you end up getting people spur the moment reactions to who they should, should, should have leading their business. And, and, and because you're at, you often are asking a bunch of men that question, they end up recommending more men, not because of a belief that men should be doing this, but because that's just the first thing that came to mind. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, to the extent that what we're trying to do is to counteract the carrot effect, we'll call that the carrot effect. Um, if we want to counteract that, we need to be more systematic outside of the context of needing to answer the question on the spur of the moment. So okay. I'm writing down shows that we have to do. The, the carrot, carrot effect, effect, carrot effect yeah. and the that'll chocolate a, cake study. That's right. Well, we can we just get this be, recording? That'll be we'll, a, yeah, that'll be, <laughs> we'll, put that, we'll put the carrot effect on a pillow. Well, we have such great questions. And really, all of them talk about how can I be an effective leader? How can I create an environment where there is open discussion? How can I create an environment where people aren't distracted? So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what makes an effective leader in a boardroom setting. Well, I, you want to, I want to say one okay, thing okay, because okay. I feel like talking. Um, uh, <laughs> what's new? What's new? Yeah. This is you know, why she hold has on. To edit. There's another question. How can we avoid having one or two people dominate the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we don't know. <laughs> Not a clue. But but here's really a really cool. here's a really important point. Um, thank you. Yeah, uh, great. So so whenever we uh, we express a desire of some kind. Remember that there's what you say, what you do, and what you reward, and people listen to those things in reverse order. So what you say is actually the least important thing as a leader. What you do is more important, and what you reward is the, is the most important. So let's think about getting diversity of opinion in a, in a, in a leader, you know, as a leader. Um, so for one thing, you could say, I, I want you all to speak up. I'm interested in your opinions. Okay, if you shut down discussion as soon as it stops going your way, then you are doing something that, that, that flies in the face of that. And if the people who get the most you know, attention, the most kudos from you, are the ones who agree with you, then you are rewarding behavior that is different from what you said. Now, that's a simple example, but I think you know, more broadly, generally speaking, we want to really make sure that we align the rewards that we have. Rewards can be money, but, but they actually, you know, when you get to the level of being on a board, it's not really the money. It's, it's the social access, and it's the, it's, the, it's the opportunity to be part of, of important projects and decisions and being part of an inner circle. Those are really the rewards. And, and, and then there are your actions. To what degree are you really allowing discussions to go off in directions you did not anticipate? If you don't align those things, then you don't get a diversity of opinion. What you get is a whole bunch of people who figured out that what you really want to hear is, is your words repeated back to you in slightly different form. Yeah. You know, there's a, um, an, an, an interesting saying that I, I, I've now stolen. I don't know who I originally heard it from. <laughs> uh, probably aren't. Did uh, that, that, that I, that I, that I say at the end of overlong meetings uh, to bring the meeting to a close? And, uh, and it's this. I say, you know, I, th I think uh, everything that can be said about this topic has already been said. It just hasn't yet been said by everyone. Uh, which which I, I, I think, you know, when, when you see what happens, uh, when there's a need to sort of be part of the group, and you see the drift that the group is going in, I, I think many people feel a need to know, well, now I need to say that too, right? And, and I, I, I think Rebecca's question, or whoever's question this is, about the idea of leadership, obviously, you know, you guys have read all kinds of stuff about leadership and leadership styles and all kinds of things, but 
the people who seem to be effective in dealing with human beings, because that's what leadership is about, it's dealing with other human beings, right, is creating situations where things get, have a chance to unfold before you intervene. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm known by my colleagues as a pretty good meeting runner, right? But one of the reasons that I do that is I, I, I do have an idea about the timing of how things are going to unfold, but as you can tell, Art and I are rather loquacious old men, uh, and, and I have to sort of tell myself, you may not talk until several other people have spoken first. And if there's some people who are quiet and not talking, I invite them to talk. I say, you know, I haven't heard anything from you yet, John or Sally or whatever, and, and what are you thinking about this? And oftentimes, people who tend not to express their ideas, if you have given them back to Art's idea of having time to write, and now I say, well, Sally, you haven't said anything yet, or, or John, you haven't said anything yet, they don't have to concoct something in the moment. They've already written about it, they've thought about it, and now they're just reporting out something that's already been some, somewhat figured out in their own thinking, right? Now that creates a different kind of environment in a meeting because if you don't know where the meeting's going and the person who's running the meeting says, okay, so what's your idea? And it, well, I, I, you, now I've got to come up with something. And as Art says, it, it's interesting how much we value more things that are more easily accessible from memory. So what comes to mind first? And I say carrot, you know, or whatever it happens to be. Well, now I'm sort of committed to carrots because I said it, and people heard me say it, and I can't look like I'm weak, you know, I need to defend my carrot, uh, because that's the first thing that came to mind. So that leadership characteristic that allows you to sort of organize the timing of what's gonna happen, but is very deliberate about making sure I need to hear from people who have had time to work out some ideas in advance and keep myself out of it until it's a more propitious time to intervene. Again, for those of us who are, you know, glib and like to talk and it's great fun, it's a real challenge to do that. And many people who are very effective, very smart people, have very good ideas, come to think, you know, because my ideas are so good, and, and they actually are proven good all the time, <laughs> I should talk, right? And, and I, because I will help move the meeting along. And you know, a phrase that people used to say about drug use in the 60s or 70s, the phrase that said, speed kills. You know, and, and speed leads to bad decisions often. Yeah. So, so now we're gonna, you know, now, now, now the, now the concept of a twenty-four carat idea is a, is <laughs> oh, a Jesus, <laughs> completely okay. different thing. But I, but I, um, <laughs> thank but you, I, folks. Thank you. We're here all night. Oh, um, tip the staff. The, uh, the, but, but I, but I want to, I want to, I want to emphasize one of the things that 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 Bob was talking about, which is this concept of listening. So it turns out that most of us are horrible listeners. Uh, if, you, if you look at most people, they listen long enough to figure out what they're going to say next, and then they stop listening and, because they're holding in mind what they're going to say next so that they don't forget it. And now, now the rest of the discussion need, you know, really didn't happen. Um, one of the things that, that, there's two things that that means. One is you should always have a piece of paper in front of you to write down the idea of what you want to say next so you don't have to hold it in mind so that you don't basically have the equivalent of seven digits in mind while somebody's talking. Mm -hmm. um, but the other is to recognize that, that really hearing what other people have said is actually ultimately uh, probably the most important leadership skill. Um, is, is because it, it turns out that, that that ability to integrate the really good ideas that other people have into something that is greater than the sum of its parts is what separates the great leaders from everybody else. Um, and, and, you know, that's not a, I mean, we often, you know, we live in a, you know, so, so, so we talked about this notion of independence and interdependence. Not only are men in general more independent than women, but, but, but Westerners, uh, compared to East Asians, for example, are more independent. We, we, we tend to value individualism. Um, and people who are in leadership situations uh, often are very independent people. We think of ourselves, you know, we, we, we prize great people doing great things in difficult situations. What we have to recognize, though, is that um, there's a difference between consensus and drawing on the best ideas of the group around you. 
So as a leader, you don't always need to go with what the group consensus is. There are going to be times where you may feel like you need to go in a somewhat different direction than what most people think is the best thing to do. But you also need to make sure that you draw on and acknowledge the really great ideas that other people are bringing to the table. Um, because because that, that group development of, of ideas ends up often being much better than what any individual would have come up with. Yeah, and I, you know, I'd like to suggest a dependent measure, a way of assessing one's effectiveness as a board leader. Um, and and, it, and it's, a, it's a very simple idea, and that's asking the question, have I exploited what's valuable about every person in the room? Right? Not that I've gotten them all to be happy or gotten them all to agree, but have I gotten the most from everybody that's in this room? Now, if you ask that question, you, you, you recognize that if there are some people who never speak, who never offer an idea, and when they do, it's just to agree with somebody else's idea and those kind of things, you could rightly ask the question, why, why, why are we wasting that chair on that person? Because they contribute little or nothing. They're just here, and I've got a body and a name on the masthead, and okay, fine. But if you really are leading effectively, the, the key to making that happen is you recognize that everyone probably has something of value to contribute if we've made a good decision about selecting members of the board, and how can I make sure that that value is capitalized, right? Because that's, that would be a loss, right? That would be a waste to say, I've got a mind in the room that I'm not hearing from. Right? that I'm not getting information from. I've got this valuable thing of this person who's probably on the board because they've got a lot of experience or they're, they're really a good re, re, th really good thinker and they're creative or whatever, but I'm not really getting the value that's, that I, I could be getting from that person. And, and the thing that that does about leadership, it not only serves a purpose in the fact that you're getting the most bang for the buck, but, but even, even more than that, right? You create an environment in the room where everybody recognizes that they have contributed something, right? If, if, if I go to meetings, I mean, everyone who hates meetings when they go to them, it's that they, you know, you know, I could have read this in an email. I didn't have to schlep here to sit in a room with people to know about this. But when you go to a meeting, you think, it was a good meeting. It's probably because you recognize that you made a contribution that had you not been there, that probably wouldn't have happened. Right? Now you change the equation about what people's individual calculus is about what's worth my time and what's not worth my time. You know, I mean, okay, so maybe you go and you know you go to some nice hotel somewhere and you, know, you get a couple nice meals and you know have an interaction with your friends. But if you want the meetings to be valuable, you you've got to have that as part of the feature. So, so as a pillow, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. A mind is a terrible thing. God, it, we we should write that down. That's what a great phrase. Great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. You know, you know I, I have to say this. <laughs> you know, when Dan Quayle was vice president, I, 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 I don't know if you can tolerate a Dan Quayle joke, but I can't let this go. He, he tried to say that in mind in several ways, and, 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 he, and, and what he said instead was, it's a terrible thing to lose one's mind or not to have a mind, how true that is. And I, that's why Dan Quayle is no longer in the public eye. But anyway, go, go ahead. That's a digression. You know, I mean, we have time for just like one more thought, I think. And I wonder if we so can like talk about <laughs> <laughs> a couple days. Yeah, a couple days. Yeah, yeah. But someone asked the, the question of like, you know, well, how can how can I justify making a decision based on how I feel? Like I, I have this negative reaction to this feeling. How can I justify that? And I think we can talk about that in a variety of ways. And I love this quote by Daniel Kahneman that's like, hindsight is the biggest fallacy of mankind. <laughs> So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about decisions and how we understand a good decision versus a bad decision and how we can justify yeah. our gut reactions. Yeah, so, so the very first thing we need to do is, is people need to learn more about the way they think. I mean, this is why we do what we do. Because, because the part of the problem is we actually believe that justifications are the gold standard for what made something a good decision. Yeah. And so uh, there are times where we, you know, you, you, you think to yourself, you know what, this, this really feels like the right decision. And if you say that to somebody, then they look at you and they go, well, pff, that's not a good reason. Well, to say that is a misunderstanding of, 
the underlying psychology. There really is information in the fact that this feels like a good decision. You know, I, and, and you know, Bob's phrase that good decisions should think right and feel right, part of what that means is that both elements of that should actually play a role and there are going to be times where you're going to say, you know what, this part of what part of part of what makes this a good decision is that it feels like the right thing to do. Yeah. So, so part of that requires educating people on what those feelings are doing. That 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 actually because we are able to integrate a lot of information based on on our motivations, because those feelings are coming from whether our motivational system feels like we are approaching a goal, all of those things are, are signs that, that, that actually our, our feelings are providing us with, with some amount of good information. Now, um, you know, you, you don't want that to be the only thing that you're using to justify a decision. Um, but, but we should be wary of justifying decisions primarily because the story is good and the decision itself doesn't feel good. Right. We, we need to educate people that both of those things ultimately need to play a role. And, and one of the things that that means, this is the last thing I'll say on this, one of the things that that means is that any time that there is a misalignment between the way that you feel and the story that you're telling, you should at least try to be able to understand why there's that misalignment. Now, yeah. there will be times where this feels terrible because I'm asking you to do something very different from what you've always done, and what you've always done is more comfortable than what you're doing that's new, so you can tell people, I know this is gonna feel bad, it's the right thing to do, but you're gonna feel bad about it. And then there are gonna be times where you're gonna say, you know what, I know you believe this story, but if you really you know, think about, about the source of your feelings on this, you realize that there's an ethical conflict here, and you are trying to justify that ethical conflict, you know, coming down on the wrong side of that ethical conflict by by creating a good story. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, th there are very few devices in the world that have been uh, enhanced over millions of years. Uh, but brains have done that, right? I, I mean, it, brains have been shaped over, over millennia. And the things that Art's talking about uh, were not selected out because they function effectively, right? I mean, we usually tend to think that emotional feelings, right, or our reactions to things, what we say is our gut, has no relationship to information. But I just want to emphasize something that Art just said about our gut reactions are based on memory systems that are signaling us and attempting to tell us to do something, right? And, and to ignore that and say, well, that's just, that's just an emotion, right? They, get rid of that phrase. That's, that, that's just an emotional reaction. Emotional reactions, they're often based on things that are not productive, but just as often, and perhaps even more often, they're based on things that allow us to synthesize complicated sets of variables in a way that we can't possibly parse out if we were to try to verbalize about it. And, and, and we see this all the time, right? I mean, we see this all the time in our experience when we're doing things that are very complicated that we couldn't possibly explain what it is that we're doing because our brains have figured out a way to make all that work without the necessity of our verbalizing it. So again, this is sort of leave where Art left off too. It, both of those things are valuable. They should both be considered. Uh, and to think about the why question that Art said, you know, when you start understanding, wh why would I have a reaction to this? The reaction is a signal, and that's a signal to, well, maybe, maybe we should spend some time thinking about why would I have this kind of feeling that that's a not good pathway to take. Yeah. And our signal is that we have zero time. So <laughs> thank you so much for having us. This was really a lot of fun, and I hope you Thanks. enjoyed it, too. Thanks very much.